It's no longer enough to create games that are just engaging and fun. Developers need to make use of every available avenue possible in order to extract as much time and money from players as they can. So much so, in fact, that artificial intelligence is now being used to target people to an unprecedented level. In this video, we're going to be covering whether the argument against games being addictive has any merit, or if it's just based in fear and misunderstanding. I'll go through some of the psychological tactics that game companies are using to keep you hooked. And finally, I'll talk about what the future of the gaming industry will look like, especially with the focus now on free-to-play and mobile games, and what, if anything, can be done about it. Throughout the history of video games, people have raised concern about their potentially addictive nature. Countless stories get released on the news and online about children and adults spending an unholy amount of time playing video games. They're neglecting their health, their hygiene, their relationships and their work. And the sad truth about this is, for the majority of the 47 years or so that video games have been around, they weren't always designed to keep you hooked. For the most part, they were built to be fun, enriching experiences. However, in recent years, the gaming industry has taken an entirely different approach. With the rise of mobile gaming, the decreasing attention spans, the need for constant stimulation and connection in a world that's more connected than ever, the state of gaming had to change to follow suit. What was once a model focused on building fun, interactive experiences has now devolved into microtransaction fueled, gambling focused, free to play and oftentimes buggy and broken experiences that exist for the sole purpose of taking your hard-earned money in the largest quantity as possible. Now, obviously this isn't the case for every game. There's a ton of games out there that are incredible, they're detailed, they're well-built, they've been created with love and passion, and they're designed to be incredible experiences for the user. However, when you consider that when the majority of video games that people play are either mobile or created by large AAA publishers such as EA, Blizzard, Activision, and others, it's hard to not place a lot of the blame on them. So if you ask me the question of whether or not video games are designed to be addictive, 15 years ago, I'd say no, although there were some outliers at the time. However, it's no longer worth debating in 2020. Too many games nowadays are designed to be addictive and that number is not going down anytime soon. Now, it's all well and good me telling you that games are designed to be addictive, but how exactly are they designed to keep you hooked? Well, as it turns out, there's actually a lot of reasons why. The first one we're gonna get into is the Skinner's Box experiment. If you're unfamiliar with what this is, back in the 50s, a scientist by the name of B.F. Skinner discovered that you can control behavior through the process of reward and stimuli. One example is the classic rat in a cage experiment, where a rat learned to receive food by pulling a lever entirely on its own. This is used extensively in video games, which shouldn't really be much of a surprise when you think about it and how rewards work. So if you do X, you'll get Y in return. The reason why it's so effective in video games is because the designers use it strategically to ensure they get the biggest reaction from you. If the designers threw this in your face at every constant possibility, you'd get bored of it pretty quickly, and you'd soon become numb to the reward. What they do is time their rewards to specific points in the game to make you justify the effort that you put in versus the reward you receive. If you spend a long time working on something and the reward is terrible, you're gonna be pretty pissed off about it. If they appropriately match the size of the reward to the effort you put into it and scale it accordingly as time goes on, it's gonna be way more effective at keeping you playing. With the rise of microtransactions, it's a problem that's more prevalent than ever before mostly because it never used to be a problem. I remember when they released that horse armor for Oblivion and people were outraged, although they did still buy it. Equating real wealth with virtual wealth makes gamers much more invested in their character. For a lot of gamers, their online wealth is all they have. It's an amalgamation of their life progress, their achievements, and their friendships. And microtransactions make up a huge proportion of profits for game developers, mostly because the biggest games in the world are entirely free to play and wouldn't actually exist without them, which is all well and good. It allows companies to make the argument that these purchases are entirely optional. However, when you realize that kids are getting bullied in school for not having a skin in Fortnite and being labeled as a default, you know that it's become a bit of a problem. Now, the next point is somewhat tied to the Skinner's Box model, and it's to do with reinforcement ratio. More specifically, 
It's about creating a variable reinforcement ratio instead of a fixed one. But what exactly does this mean? So if a game such as World of Warcraft had a fixed reinforcement ratio of one, that means that every time you level up, you're always going to receive the same reward. What actually happens is that every time you level up, you're given a random reward. Now it's not random across different characters. You're still gonna get the same thing with every new character you play, but what you get from leveling up from one to two is gonna be different from two to three and so on. And that's what's known as a variable reinforcement ratio. Now a number of studies have been done to show that a variable reinforcement ratio is by far and away the most effective way to keep people playing your game. And this is also apparent in the world of loot boxes. They've been banned in a number of countries worldwide due to their likeness to gambling, and rightly so. And there have even been a number of cases of people losing their entire life savings to loot boxes. A lot of games reward you on level up with a reward, such as a loot box or a similar item. Again, making use of this variable reinforcement ratio. They provide you with this reward, which might be great initially, but then you realize that you have to pay real money to open it, usually in the form of purchasing a key. You might think nothing of spending a couple of dollars on a one-time purchase, but as a lot of gamblers will understand, it's difficult to stop at just one. Perhaps they showed you a spinning wheel, like in roulette, and if you played roulette and your ball landed on an adjacent number to the one that you chose, you're gonna be much more likely to spend more money and spin again. And a similar thing goes on with loot boxes and developers are fully aware of this. What happens in a lot of games, especially MMOs, is that when you receive this loot box as a reward for the first time, they also give you a key to open it for free. They've already opened the doors for this gambling cycle to begin. Also, if they see that you open loot boxes or are more likely to open them, they can use their powerful targeting algorithms to ensure that you spend more in the future. They might give you a specific discount on a certain item at a certain time, or slightly increase the chance of you receiving an item that you, they know that you've wanted for a long time. They might even push up the chances of you getting a rare item in the first few boxes to make it more likely for you to keep playing after you win a big reward. And it's actually completely legal for them to do this. They even have patents in place to allow them to meticulously target and pinpoint these ideal customers that they think will spend a lot of money on loot boxes. People that they refer to as whales which is a common term borrowed from the gambling industry. Recently, the developers of Transformers mobile game boasted that they'd created an AI algorithm that could easily pinpoint these so-called whales with up to 90% certainty. And what ended up happening? A player made the news for spending over $150,000 in that Transformers game. So tell me again how these companies have your best interests at heart. Last on my list is probably my least favorite introduction into the world of gaming or mobile gaming at least, and that's this idea of daily rewards and streaks. The basic idea is that every day you log into your mobile game of choice, you're given a reward. And for each subsequent day you do so, your reward increases. And generally you'll get a big award if you make it to seven days, 30 days, or in some cases, 90 days. And at the time when you first start this game, this reward that you get for seven days of constant play seems ridiculously great. However, once you get to that point, you realize that re the reward you got for seven or 30 days of playtime isn't actually that good in the first place. This is why a large number of games offer a seven or 30 day free trial. They know that if they can do anything they can to get you through that first period and keep you playing, you're much more likely to continue to be invested and spend your money and playtime on that specific game. And a lot of this is because of the value you've perceived to put into the game. You've put all this time and effort into playing, you might as well carry on. If you download any of the top games on the App Store, you'll see this daily reward or daily bonus and login streaks all the time. It's even starting to creep into desktop games as well. But that finishes my list for this video of psychological tactics that the game industry is employing. If you want to read more, make sure you check the description below and read the article that we created on why video games are designed to be addictive. It was created in collaboration with a friend of mine who's a master in behavioral psychology and an avid gamer. And so it was a really fun thing to write and I hope you enjoy it as much as I did creating it. But just to finish up, I'll just go into a few things about the direction the industry is heading and what we can do, if anything, about it. The approach that a large number of developers are taking now, going from a value-focused approach to a money-focused approach, is something that I believe is extremely damaging to the industry. It reminds me of the gambling and tobacco industries of yesteryear. We're at the point where the necessary sanctions and regulations aren't in place yet, and although they're being discussed, companies are trying to do whatever they can to extract as much profits 
as they can before eventually the inevitable happens and they get regulated. Couple this with the fact that 90% of America play video games and over 50% of the entire world, which is two and a half billion active gamers, it becomes a recipe for disaster. People are being preyed on for the personal gain of these companies and it's hurting them in the long run. These are corporations that are actively trying to fight against things like the classification by the World Health Organization of gaming disorder being a real disease. And the South Korean government even went so far as to say that this classification will, will have catastrophic effects on their video game industry and that the decision needs to be reversed. It's simply mind blowing to me that people are so focused on profits that they fail to see how a group of people there's not even three to four percent of a population that struggle with video game addiction could bring an entire industry to its knees. But of course, all that matters is how much money they can put into their shareholders' profits. Companies need to do more for the people who are having their lives destroyed by video games. They need to recognize that this new approach to gaming is only effective in the short term. It's eventually going to bite them in the ass, and I feel like they're too focused on what's in front of them to notice. Anyway, I think I've said enough about what I needed to. What do you think? Are video games designed to be addictive? Or is it solely down to the individual? Do you think companies should be held more responsible for their actions? Drop a comment down below and let me know. I'd love to know what you think. And as always, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, don't forget to like and subscribe to Game Quitters to stay notified of any future updates. Don't forget to check out the article below and I'll see you in the next video. Peace.